Intel has decided that it's time to reinvent itself. It's got some big advancements that are coming out down the pipeline that may revolutionize computers as we know it, and they want to make sure that you know their number is smaller than the competitors. Tesla's numbers, however, are way up, with them reporting record profits and record car sales, and Apple has a record of not trusting itself for its upcoming Mac Pro lineup. Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your host, Brett. We're going to be going over the hottest tech news that I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast so that you can start your day off right. And if you want to submit something that you want me to cover here on this very show, you can do so over on our Discord server, which I'll leave linked in the video description. We'd love to have you as part of our community. And in case there's something that you want discussed on this show that maybe I'm not touching on, just post it in the Tech News channel and we might be able to feature it in one of our shows. And Intel wants to feature off all of the new technology that they have with them having their showcase to just tell you about everything that they're doing. Big things that are happening, such as they're producing more 10 nanometer wafers than they are 14 nanometer wafers, which means that they've successfully moved past 2015. Everybody give it up for Intel, congratulate them on their success, but they also released the roadmap of everything that they're going to be doing up until 2025, which is going to potentially get them ahead of the competition. IBM, Samsung, AMD, y'all going down to Intel. Let's talk about what they had, and that is mostly name changes, my friend friends, they want you to know that they are as good as TSMC. You think AMD's fancy because they're on seven nanometers? All right, well, our 10 nanometers is now gonna be called Intel 7, and our seven nanometers is gonna be called Intel 4, and our seven nanometer plus is gonna be called Intel 3, and then our two nanometer is gonna be called 20A because we're going beyond silicon. This is the angstrom era of CPU measurement, okay? 20A, 20 angstrom, okay? That's how they're gonna measure things things from now on. Also being in that roadmap are technologies being implemented like EUV as well as new ribbon FET and power via technologies which are going to be part of Intel's key strategy for getting ahead of the competition as a mentoring as well as Foveros being a big play there as well. Now this may just seem like posturing by Intel and I know a lot of people in our comments tend to be like but AMD is on seven nanometers already when we talk about Intel seven nanometers but it's incredibly important to realize that none of this is standard Everybody was already making up their names to begin with. You have Samsung with their seven nanometer stuff going to six, going to four, going to three. But meanwhile, it's still all on seven nanometers. They're just calling it something completely different. So you can see here the breakdown of Intel 7, 4, 3, and 20A to get an idea of performance per watt. It does seem like Intel is getting back to that TikTok cycle, which was one year they would release a minor refresh, and then the next year they would release a major update. It does seem like we're going to be getting back to that. One of the key things to think about with this naming scheme is that transistor density is actually better on Intel's 10 nanometer than it currently is on TSMC's 10 nanometer or seven nanometer for that matter. So while TSMC is on seven nanometers and Intel's on 10 nanometers, it's actually roughly equivalent in transistor density, how many transistors they can pack on a very square millimeter of chips. So this should show you that Intel renaming their stuff is them catching up with the industry that changed their marketing language to catch up with Intel back when Intel was ahead because Intel was the leader at that point and they should have been on seven nanometers right now, which would have put everybody else in line with them. So Intel changing their name to catch up just shows that they're all just playing a game of marketing Jenga where the last one to pull the block has the towers of billions of dollars fall down on them. Even a non-tech saying that Intel is not trying to pull the wool over our eyes. There's no consistency here. There's no benchmark for what constitutes seven or 14 or 35 nanometers. It was all made up to begin with. So Intel making up a new thing just means that they're marketing like every other company in the world. But also during Intel's accelerated event, they showed off new chip designs for a bunch of the CPUs that were expected to come out sometime soon. Alder Lake, Sapphire Rapids there, as you can see, Meteor Lake and Granite Rapids right there. And then Meteor Lake with Fovero showing off 36 microns bump pitch and five to 125 watt thermal range on these chips. Intel also saying that they're having multi-factored strategies for how they're going to be moving forward. Number one is build, so that's get their seven nanometer production up and going, then expand using TSMC to produce some stuff that's not mission sensitive to everything that they're doing. And number three is productize, which is to sell out their Intel Foundry services. And by sell out, I don't mean sell off. I mean that they're actually going to provide Foundry services to other companies such as Qualcomm. Intel now has a contract to make Qualcomm chips on their 20A process. So once they finally get down to that with their ribbon fed and power via technology, 
strategy, Qualcomm will jump on board there. Also, Amazon with their AWS stuff will use Intel for packaging solutions, although they won't make Amazon's chips, they will actually mush them together and then deliver the AWS sandwich. But to sum it up in layman's terms, it looks like Intel's brand new CEO who jumped on the ship within this last year is now correcting course, has a better vision for what they're going to do, has a better sense of where the market is and how to market their actual products and to make it not look like they're failures even when they might be lagging behind and it looks like they're actually really confident that they can press forward. Whereas previous CEOs were slow to admit fault, it does look like the new CEO, Pat Gelsinger, is equipped to own up to when they're falling short and then also cast good vision for them. I'm excited for Intel's future. It does look like they have a new good head on their shoulders. What do you think of Intel and what's coming up in the future? Let me know down below in the comments. And down below, just below my like rib cage is where my back hurts the most because I have to pick up my son all day long. Anyways, I need to stretch my back out and that's where today's episode sponsored Chirp comes in. The Chirp wheel is something that I use every single day, whether it's after a nice workout or if it's just at the end of the day and I'm feeling a little stiff. I roll on my chirp wheel and then I get the best back relief that I've ever had because the chirp wheel is back relief made simple. It has the four way stretch with the spinal canal that makes it so that you get a great length and width wage stretch on your back and it can support up to 500 pounds. So if you wanna bounce on that puppy on your back for some whatever reason, you could totally do that. It would probably support it. It's honestly super simple. My wife and I use it all of the time. I can't just express how easy it is and how just like such a small thing can radically make it so that my body feels better all of the time. It's an FDA registered class one medical device. You can purchase it with your HSA savings account and you can check it out at the link in the video description if you're interested. For a limited time, you can get the Chirp Wheel three pack plus a free posture corrector for $9.99 or you could just buy one of the sizes of Chirp Wheel, whether that's the large, medium, or the deep tissue one and get with specifically what you might need. So check it out at the link in the video description big thanks to Chirp for sponsoring today's episode of Hot News. Speaking of money, let's talk about Tesla and how they made a whole heckin' lot of it. They just reported their Q2 earnings and they surpassed a billion dollars in profit, which is not something that they have done before, as well as delivering over 200,000 vehicles in one single quarter. This is something that, again, Tesla has not done before. And during the conference call about the Q2 earnings, Elon Musk expressed that they were able to do this simply because they had their own in-house software team that when there was actually a chip shortage that was going on, they were able to rewrite the firmware of different products and integrate them into the cars, even though they weren't necessarily meant for that, they were able to change the software to make it happen. So using in-house software teams, they were able to make it so that they could ship out a record number of vehicles and they were able to make a profit for the first time without the help of emissions credits because Tesla typically sells off all of the good green energy credits that it makes because it's an electric vehicle company. It sells it to all of the naughty companies who are producing all of that greenhouse gas and then they get money for it. That's how Tesla's been profitable up until now. And now Tesla's made enough profit off of their vehicles alone to be actually profitable. Also, they took a $23 million loss on Bitcoin. So that's not adding into the profit. It looks like they're actually a legitimate car company now. Wow. What? Obviously, take that with whatever argument you want to have against Tesla. Put it down below in the comments. Do you think Tesla's a legitimate car company? I want to hear from you. Let's talk about Bitcoin for a second. Tesla lost money on it. Did you? Let's get into the crypto stonks update. Bitcoin down 2% in the last 24 hours. When I recorded yesterday, I talked about how it spiked from $35,000 all the way up to around $38,500, hitting its peak of over $40,000 today, now settling down at the 37188 mark, which is actually not too shabby compared to where it was less than 48 hours ago. Ethereum also down 3% and looks like a lot of things fell off around 4 p.m. Sitting at $2,200 right now with it peaking at 24.18. Dogecoin also down 1.21%, sitting at 20 cents. Its peak being right around 23 cents, but down as I mentioned. Meme stonks, however, doing pretty well today. GameStop closing up nearly 2% to close at $183.94. AMC also doing particularly well. Wild swings every single day. 9% gain to close at $40.29. The meme stunks, they're just so unpredictable. That's why I love keeping them in here rather than me trying to go find out what happened with meme stunks. I get to put it in hot news every day, okay? You're ready as you're eating your breakfast to know what's happening in the meme stunk world before the market opens. But when does the market open on Mars, okay? I'm ready for capitalism to invade it, NASA invading it with helicopters and ingenuity helicopter flying a total of one whole mile on the Martian planet. 
planet. It completed that on its 10th flight, which was its most complex ever. Good job, Ingenuity, for flying off another surface. We're very, very proud of you. And I'm not proud of the state of Indiana because they're pulling nonsense like this, even though it reads really well. The headline goes, researchers are testing concrete that could charge your EV while you drive. Magnetized cement. Oh yeah, baby. Indiana's Department of Transport has announced that it's testing a new type of cement that will allow you to charge your EV wirelessly through the road, okay? This screams solar freaking roadways to me. That's just where I'm, the vibe that I'm getting from this. Solar freaking roadway. They're calling the magnetized cement magment. I hate that. It's also being developed in conjunction with Purdue, but saying that it has a record-breaking wireless transmission efficiency at up to 95%. You read the information for this over on the Indiana government website, which we'll leave linked in the video description, but the power loss efficiency of wireless charging, even if it's record-breaking, is staggering, and there's not a whole lot indicating that they're gonna be using solar for this or renewable resources, and that they actually just might pull this from the grid, and then they're just gonna be like, hey, let's lose 5% of our power just because we wanted to charge things wirelessly instead of having electric vehicles charge at home, which is kind of working for most people right now. Maybe we need roads that charge your cars I'm not sure we do based on what's going on with Tesla and Ford and all of these other electric car companies that are rolling out stuff. I think I think we have a good setup right now. You have way stations along like gas stations. You don't need the roads to do it. And then you just charge it home every night. It kind of actually removes the need to have things like your road charging you. I don't know. What do you think of road charging down below in the comments? Let me know. And Apple thinks that their uh, Apple Silicon is not quite ready for prime time on their Mac Pro with new leakers indicating confirming previous rumors that Apple is not going to be switching to Apple Silicon for the upcoming Mac Pro, but rather they're going to be implementing Ice Lake Xeon W3300 workstation chips, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It lets the people who spend the most money on Apple products, $50,000, $60,000 per machine, still get the CPUs that they're used to, still be in the Xeon environment that allows them to stay familiarized as they transition and give it another year before they get all of their super super professional users to switch over to Apple Silicon. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It just shows that maybe it's not quite ready. It's good for uh, carting around to college. It's not quite good for trusting million dollar projects too. And that's the end of this million dollar production. Why don't you go check out yesterday's episode where we talked about how the CPU shortage might get really, really bad and it's not gonna be good for anybody. Well, I had bad news for you yesterday. Go check that one out and I'll see you here at Hot News for Breakfast tomorrow. <laughs>